Well, good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. Uh, this is a great privilege that EWTN gives you and I because uh, we can take our own faith for granted, but when we hear the stories of others, it can inspire us to, re to see how God worked in their life as well in, our, in ours. It can also help us recognize the areas of our belief that we take for granted, that others kind of had to work hard to, to come to see and to hear and then to believe. And so our prayers are always for those who are outside the church that we hope the Lord is touching their hearts to draw them home. Our guest tonight is John Leindecker, former agnostic. Uh, he has a daily rosary meditation at dailyrosary.net, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. John, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me, Marcus. It, it's great to have you here. <laughs> Thank you. I always look forward to hearing the stories because they all come, the same fingerprints of the Holy Spirit, but, Amen. but God brings us on such different paths. Amen. Yeah, it's so true. So let me invite you. Take us back to the beginning and let's hear your journey. Well, um, man, it's a, it's a heck of a thing. Uh, was it Fulton Sheen or someone who says that sin is boring, right? It's <laughs> virtue that is exciting, right? <laughs> and uh, no, I was a young man, grew up in Independence, Kentucky. Um, Grew up what I thought was pretty normal like anybody else. My uh, my dad taught me how to throw, throw a ball and do all those things. And uh, the one thing that was a little different was he was alcoholic. Um, not the kind that would be drunk every day, but pretty consistently every week. And plenty of opportunities for me to stay at my grandma's house when he would get a DUI and not come home that night and I'd miss school or whatever. Uh, Grew up, you know, lower middle class or poor, I guess. You know, I didn't I didn't know the difference when I was yeah. younger. Right. Uh, that TV kind of latchkey generation. Uh, it's hard, you know, you think back in the life that my wife and I are trying to live now, but back then, uh, yeah. you know, I didn't know any different. My parents, you know, they did love me. They did try. They did the best they could. And uh, yeah, so I'm grateful any, for that. Any, so. any religious influence? Not really. My dad's mom was a Polish Catholic by way of a Polish Roman Catholic mother and a Greek Orthodox father, ah, huh. straight off the boat from Kalamata, Greece. Uh, wow. They shipped him over here to Chicago so that he could avoid the war. So promptly upon landing in Chicago, he enlisted and went to the war, you know, so <laughs> just as many did in that time. And yeah. then my mom's parents were both Catholic as well, but that didn't filter down to me mm, when I was wow. younger, so. Wow, 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 wow. So. Would you say that looking back, you grew up as a young boy without any idea or Im uh, image of, yeah. of God? Or... Yeah, I would say, uh, you know, it's funny that you mentioned that. I had a neighbor across the street and he had this wonderful in-ground pool and they were pretty faithful churchgoers. So if you went to vacation Bible school, you could swim in the pool and have some pizza, you know? <laughs> and uh, I remember, you know, going to this vacation Bible school and stuff like that. I always joke, I, you know, I have four daughters right now. I always say right now, you never know what's gonna be happening at home right now. But the, uh, <laughs> right now we have four daughters and I can braid their hair. This is what I remember from this vacation Bible school. We would kind of, you know, braid these candles together for the Trinity or whatever. So I guess it did come in handy but not much influence, always yeah. grew up, my parents right and wrong, you shouldn't lie, you know, moralistic kind of therapeutic deism we talk about, and I was around Christianity. Yeah. Um, but not much exposure, certainly not much to the church, except walking in my grandmother's house and seeing, you know, a, a Jesus and Mary picture on the wall, or, a, you know, I remember in her dining room, she had a, a praying Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane that yeah. so many people have, you know, but nothing, Nothing overt, you know. All right, all so. right. So there you are. Yeah. Moving forward out of that, uh, I mean, uh, I, I, in the back of my mind, I still think about the influence of your dad. Yeah. And, and uh, the struggles he was having. Yeah. yeah. So my dad, um, like I said, he was a machinist, great guy, host of friends, you know, the whole deal. Um, I guess the most, um, the most defining moment. I didn't, you know, I didn't intend for it to be in my life, but you couldn't help it. But uh, one morning, I was a pretty bad kid when I got into sixth, seventh grade, middle school, as many can be, right? <laughs> and uh, what happened was, is my mom wakes me up. My dad had just been laid off a few weeks prior. 
And uh, this was just after Christmas, around you know this time of the year, January or whatever. Yeah. And uh, funny story, I remember getting a basketball goal for Christmas, even though my parents didn't have money at the time because my dad was laid off, and we talked a bunch of trash about playing, and it was really a epic moment because my dad had been sober a couple months. And so this time he had off of work and all these things, I mean, it really was neat for him to be home when I came home. And our relationship had become different, which was beautiful. And I remember my mom waking me up. She hadn't told my dad that I was suspended from school. She was trying to hide it, but you couldn't hide it because he was laid off. <clears throat> so I don't know what we were going to do later that morning when it came to be, but she woke me up and she said, hey, your dad's having some chest pains. We're going to take him to the hospital and... Uh, you'll be fine, you know, like, we'll, we'll be back in a couple hours, okay? And I said, okay. And the next moment, I hear my mom screaming, screaming my dad's name, Fred, Fred. And I leap out of bed. I'm there. I mean, you can tell in those mm -hmm. moments of terror and panic, right? And so I leap out of bed, and I'm there in a heartbeat, and I'm looking down, and, and my mom's on the phone with 911, and my dad is dying. He's in mm -hmm. massive convulsions of what we've later come to find out as a heart attack, and he's dying. And in that moment, Marcus, if I had a defining, uh, at least the first defining prayer I had with God, except for, you know, help me pass this test or those things. But I remember I was a, I was a bad kid, or at least people were telling me I was starting to be a bad kid. And uh, I said, God, if you let my dad live, I'll stop cussing. I'll stop messing with girls. I'll stop doing, you know, fighting at school, all these things that are getting me suspended. If you let my dad live, if you're there, you'll let my dad live. And what happened was, is the, the ambulance driver was supposed to drive me with him. He was a volunteer firefighter, and he knew my dad, and he was supposed to take me. And what happened was, is he forgot in the panic of my dad. And I was alone in the house for half an hour, 45 minutes, till my grandmother came to get me. Mm -hmm. And she took me to the hospital, and we went into the little room where they give the consult of what's happening. And the doctor looked at my mom and said, Mrs. Leindecker, I regret to inform you, but your, your husband passed away today at... 8.27 a.m. or whatever. And so for me, you know, that moment was so, so incredible having oh. cried out to God and thinking he's either not there or he doesn't care. Mm -hmm. And we were walked back, you know, as they often do, they walk the family back. You can view the body the last time. Mm -hmm. And my mom walked over to my dad and I couldn't, I was paralyzed. Mm -hmm. And she's tucking my dad in and she's just saying, Fred, you look so cold. And I said, how could a God that they told me was so loving be a part of anything like this? Hmm. And so I knew. My decision was made, yeah. so to speak, wow. you know. And people quickly told me that I was the man of the house. And what I knew about the man in the house was is he drank. And hmm. he smoked weed. And he did these things, you know. And so I very quickly, you know, some people, I'm always an overachiever, I think, you know, when I came to the church, I just couldn't stop reading or whatever. I mean, I'm not an overachiever, but um, maybe an addictive personality is a better, you know, better descriptor. And so what happened was as soon as I started drinking, I remember, you know, it was like on a Tuesday night, most people in high school or middle school, they start drinking on the weekend. Uh, I started drinking on a Tuesday and I stayed drunk for about three years, you know, or drunk or high drugs, whatever, you know, mm -hmm. didn't. I wasn't discriminating as long as I could. High school? Does it mean high school Well, this time? is middle school. I'm middle school in the middle wow. of seventh grade at that time. And wow. uh, I actually, you know, I guess my one claim to fame is uh, very few people I went to college with could say they never actually finished seventh grade. I don't, I didn't have a transcript of a completed seventh grade. So um, thanks be to God, what God's done with uh, my uh, ignorance and sin, right? Yeah. So Wow. But, wow, wow. Um, three years. Um, I think there was used to be a movie called The Lost Weekend. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so you kind of got lost three years. I mean, as you look back Amen. back on that. Yeah. Um, and did did the 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 memory of your prayer, unanswered prayer, come flit flit back into your thinking during that time, or had yeah. you said, "There's no God"? Boom. Case yeah. closed. Yeah, I think. Um... I think it haunted me. I was always as a young man, okay, so I'll give you a scenario. When I was when I was in first or second grade, you know, parents earmuffs for your kids if you do this or not. But I remember when I found out there was no Santa Claus, my next door neighbor told me he was an older kid and I came into my mom real upset and stirred and she's doing laundry and 
I sat on her waterbed across from the laundry room. You know, this is the yeah. 80s, Marcus, you know, waterbed, you know. <laughs> and uh, I sit down and I say, Mom, you know, Derek said there's no Santa Claus. Is that true? And she gets real sad and, you know, fumbling yeah. for words. And she says, well, John, you know, Santa is the spirit of Christmas. And I thought about it, and I'm amazed I put this together as a kid, I guess, you know, like, um, more amazed that I'm not bright enough to put this together. But the, uh, I said to her, I said, so does that mean God's the spirit of being nice? And she was, and there was a toy up in the laundry room that she'd actually forgot to give me. And I guess to shut me up and not do any more philosophical questions, she kind of handed me the toy like, here you go, you know. And I was like, huh. So when you asked, did the God question haunt me? That I, I felt like from that moment, in yeah. a sense, the God question haunted me. Or yeah. Um, even yeah. as a kid, having that longing, you know, that um, that needle-sized hole in our heart, if you will, yeah. it's like as big as a needle, but an ocean of pleasure can't fill it. Hmm. And so what happened was, is um, yeah, there's times in my life where I remember those, the hole being gone, um, hmm. and I chase that. You know, hmm. I chase that. Um, certainly first through drugs and alcohol and unchastity and things like that. But um, I would always reflect, you know, in times mm -hmm. of, you know, drunkenness or revelry or whatever you want to call it, I would, I would look back and I'd be like, you know, we'd be smoking weed and sitting with guys, you know, oh man, is there a God, you know, the cosmic questions, I guess, you know, so. Our guest is John Leyendecker. Well, you know, John, <clears throat> it's amazing how, when people have the big questions, if they get an answer, whether it's right or wrong, but it seems to make sense, they can hang all their hats on that answer. Amen. And then the, as if the question no longer exists, because I got this answer. Mm -hmm. And that little answer you gave as a young man, well, does that mean that God is just the spirit of being nice? You know, that's, that's kind of, a, if you will, a scary answer. Because once you, if you got that answer, that answers it all. That's all God right. is. You know, uh, Freud says he's just this figure that we've come up with. Right. Well, but that's kind of like that little answer you gave as a young man. He's just the spirit of being nice. Absolutely. And you know, there you are. The the, the question's answered. Move on. Right. Yeah. And so, I, uh, man, I, I lived fast. Almost died young. You know, several mm -hmm. times were. You know, I always said to myself, I'm not going to be like my dad. You know, I'm going to be something better. Or I'm going to do all this stuff, right? And uh, there I was, you know, to fast forward through kind of all the drama, if you will. You know, first all points bulletin for my arrest at 13, 14 years old. You know, all these different things. Um, really, uh, really involved in selling drugs, fencing, stolen stuff, you know, all the different stuff. Um I remember being on a hospital table, right? Mm -hmm. And I was at this hospital in Cincinnati where I was, you know, lived. And I remember being on that and having a moment of clarity and knowing that, you know, I had to stop living this way, but I knew I was incapable of it. I couldn't, you know, it had to kind of be a power greater than myself, if you will. And uh, I cried out to that God I didn't believe mm -hmm. in or didn't believe cared or whatever. And I said, God, if you're there, you owe me. Because I, I need to stop what I'm doing or I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take my own life. And you asked before, is there one, th you know, some things that stayed with me from religious upbringing? And uh, what I thought, you know, what you hear, right? I heard, you know, well, you can't commit suicide because you'll go to hell, right? And even though I didn't believe in God and I didn't believe in these things, I was, you know, Pascal's opposite wager. I was like, <laughs> oh, man, that's tough, you know. Uh, obviously, knowing so much more about God and his mercy now, but the... Man, it was it was a powerful sentiment, power, powerful enough to where on this hospital bed I was like, God, you either got to help me or I got to end it, you know. But it, it's, it speaks of the importance of planting those seeds young Amen. in our children. Amen. They they may not seem to be blooming right now, but they may someday when it's necessary. Amen. And that's Amen. What's happening yeah. in your life? Were you alone in this? I mean, did you have siblings or a mother? But she just so, you know, beside herself. Yeah. On how to... Only child. Um, you know, and it, it sounds horrible now, you know, but my mom's sober and faithful lady um, now, which has been beautiful to watch through it all. But um, at the time, you know, I smoked weed with my mom and, you know, did all this stuff. I mean, it was 
she was so broken over my dad's death. I was so broken. She didn't she didn't know yeah. what to do. I didn't have siblings or anything. Yeah. And so it was just kind of out of control. And I remember getting to that point, having this moment of clarity, and then getting out of the hospital. Oh, did, did the Lord answer your prayer at that point? Or is that where, is that where we're heading? <coughs> Excuse me. He, uh, he did. Yeah. I get out of the hospital and I get in touch with a 12-step program because I knew I couldn't drink again, but I knew I didn't have the power. And when I got in touch with them, I started going to meetings okay. and encountering this power greater than me, giving it a shot. I think it was a soft sell. It wasn't Christianity, right. which was really nice at the time for me, kind of uh, enter in this on your own terms, if you will. But I was longing, I was searching, you know, that's what the drugs were trying to fill, the mm -hmm. alcohol, everything. And so I'm sober a couple years, studying Zen Buddhism and a number of different things, you know, and trying to fill the hole, trying to do it, but having some powerful experiences along the way. I remember being at an AA meeting, it was on Thanksgiving, uh, a 12-step meeting. Yep. And I was on that and they called on me and the topic was gratitude. And when I, <coughs> excuse me, sure. the, uh, when I got up there, I said, I'm grateful I don't have to live the way I did. And I called out to God in my heart and I started crying. And it was the first time in my life that I cried because of gratitude. And I, it was, it was incredible for me. It's the first time I felt the presence of God. And so that was the beginning. I can't remember which of the steps it is, but one of the steps, of course, is the significant other. Right. <clears throat> yeah. When you look back on that, was, was that a significant part of this journey for you during that 12 step yeah. period? Yeah, I would say that, <clears throat> excuse me, the, uh, the whole step process, really, but, you know, second, came to believe that a power greater than ourselves right. could restore us to sanity. Three, giving your will and your life over. <clears throat> Demonstrating you've done that by the fourth step, which is essentially an examination of conscience. You know, yeah. looking at your resentments, your fears, your sexual behavior, stuff like that. And then confessing that to another human being. And then six and seven, you know, the prescription is in step five, you would spend an hour alone with God. And then in six and seven, you identify the defects and ask God to take them away. Hmm. It's confession. You know, it's, yeah. it's the, you know, little in-depth, you know, uh, as Ignatius talks about, St. Ignatius, the, the whole life examine, if you yeah. will, <clears throat> general confession. And then my life began to change drastically as I entered into making amends for different things, um, eight and nine. <clears throat> and then... Uh, I would say a big turning point in 10, you're starting to do a daily examination. It's really a review of your day, 10 and 11, and then seeking God. Hmm. And this seeking God was a key part for me. You know, I started, this is when I start reading a lot of books and things. Hmm. And I always wanted to be spiritual. I had this experience or encounter with God of some variety. I, I was convinced there was a God now. Hmm. And I was <clears throat> also convinced that he was interested in my life and he cared personal, right? And so I started reading things like, you know, the Dhammapada, which is a Buddhist text. And I started reading, you know, these kind of near Eastern things and dabbling a little bit. I remember a book, particularly Zen spirit, Christian spirit, that's mm -hmm. kind of a, a syncretism, if you will. And I started doing this crazy practice. But the people that I was around in this 12 step program talked to me pretty constantly about the need to spend time in prayer, in quiet, quiet meditation. <clears throat> and I increased it, you know, spent a couple minutes at first. And I had, I remember buying an egg timer and the guys I was hanging around were <laughs> real deal. You know, they were, they were spending half an hour, 45 minutes in silence every day with their understanding of God. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so I started doing this sitting longer and longer, you know, uh, the Zen kind of meditation kind of synced up with that a little bit for me, but it, it wasn't true Buddhism. It was an American style Buddhism where you can be spiritual, but still do whatever you want morally in some ways. Wow. Right. Yeah. Um, it looks good for girls at the time, you know, but I was, I was honestly seeking. And I remember I was there one morning and I set the timer for about 45 minutes. And this was after I had had a stint where I went snowboarding in Salt Lake city, Utah. 
I spent a winter out there basically. Went snowboarding for 65 days. You know, it was a, a dream opportunity when I was 17 turning 18. And I just bus tables, double shift one day, then the next day would snowboard, and the next day bus tables. And I'd go to 12-step meetings. And that was my life, and I, I was pretty happy. But I would sit on these mountains, and I would think to myself, who made this? You know, like, this has got to be the argument from design, if you will, now. I understand. But if God made everything this way, and if water's only made H2O, snow's only made H2O, then there's got to be, like, laws for the spiritual life, too. Like, if he designed this, he had to design something else. This is my logic at the time. And I started praying a very dangerous prayer, Marcus. I started praying, God, show me the truth. <laughs> And this is, I'm back in Cincinnati. I'm getting my GED at this point. I've been sober almost three years, I guess. And I start praying this prayer. And in my meditation that morning, you know, I'm not, I'm no mystic. I'm nothing like that. But I hear this quiet voice as I'm praying this prayer. Show me the truth. That's what I'm seeking. I'm, I'm thinking, man, I'll be a Christian if you want me to be a Christian. Rock bands and lattes. That's what I was thinking. Um, not to denigrate my Protestant brothers and sisters, but that was my experience yeah. I had had so far. And then I'll go to Tibet and be a Buddhist monk tomorrow. I will go on Hajj to Mecca tomorrow. Whatever the truth is, God, show me. And this wasn't Charlton Heston, Ten's Commandments or anything, but I'd been sitting there still for several minutes. And I just heard this still small voice said, go to Mass. <laughs> what? And Marcus, I'll tell you, after my dad died, my only experience of Catholicism was is that my mom said, you need discipline. And she put me in a Catholic school for about three days before I was expelled. And I said, whoa, you know, I'm, this is a weird experience. It's not a thundering voice. It's a Morgan Freeman whisper, you know, go to mass. And I said, God, if that's really you, they don't want me. Remember, I got thrown out of there, you know. And I remember I was like, if this is true, you got to put it in front of me. And that night I went to a 12-step meeting and you don't, you know, there are plenty of people there that practice and are faithful to their religions, their faiths or whatever. But for the most part, it's kind of taboo. You know, a lot of people talk about recovering Catholics and stuff like that, you know, recovering from the Catholic guilt. And my friend comes up to me afterwards and I'm, what am I? I'm 17 years old at this point, been sober a couple of years. And he says, hey man, I don't know what you're doing tonight. But I'm going to Mass at 10 p.m. Do you want to go? What? Are you serious? And this was the last guy in the world that I expected. Long hair, you know, kind of hippie-ish type guy at the time, you know. <clears throat> and he invites me to Mass. And I'm floored because that morning yeah. I had heard that, go to Mass. I mean, how does the Lord work that way, you know? Well, you know, it's sad. I don't mean to interrupt your flow there, but it, it's sad that we feel the need to kind of belittle that. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? We, we've got Amen. to kind of make it. But why? that's what God does. Yep. He, he speaks. does that. And yeah. he did it for you. Yeah. yeah. And so I go to Mass that night. And it's 10 p.m. during the week. It's on a college campus. And I walk into this church. And this it begins. And I walk in. I see a statue of the Blessed Mother. And it's on the left-hand side when I walk in. And it's dark. These priests had turned the lights down. It's a very solemn kind of Mass. 10 p.m. at night on a weekday, and there's candles at her feet. It's beautiful, stirred by beauty. And I hear another voice, same voice that said, go to Mass, said, that's your mother. And I started sobbing. Hmm. I mean, I literally started sobbing. And my friend's like, man, are you okay? Dude, you okay? <clears throat> and I said, yeah. I, I said, yeah, let's just go. And, I, you know, we go through Mass, you know, the joke, you know, Catholic calisthenics, sit, stand, kneel. I think we did burpees at the time. I'm not <laughs> sure, you know. And uh, we got to that part of the Mass, and this is this is where I, be, I became Catholic at this point. That's what I believe. You know, I fell in love with Christ. And the priest elevates the host, says, Behold the Lamb of God. Behold Him who takes away the sins of the world. Happy are those called to this banquet. And I lost it. I, I mean... Marcus, we're talking ugly crying. Like, I'm, I am <laughs> under the pew, like, can't catch my breath crying. And I knew three things in that moment, three things that I probably had no business knowing. But first and foremost, I knew I was loved. That same encounter I had had mm -hmm. at that 12-step meeting where I felt so loved, I felt so loved, but in the midst of it, so ugly because mm -hmm. of my own sin, mm -hmm. my own brokenness, but so loved in spite of it, you know? 
It's only love that shows us our sin, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that really is love shows us our sin. So often I don't, you know, with people I evangelize or work with today, I don't have to tell them they're wrong. Most people know they're no, wrong. No. Deep, Deep down, down inside they know. Yeah. But if I love them and I'm just who I am because of Christ, it changes people. Hmm. Second, I knew everything they said about Jesus had been true. That he was God. That he really was the Son of Man. He was the Savior. I, I knew. But I think most convicting and what I was uh, later a little unhappy about a couple weeks later uh, was that he was right there on the altar and I had to become Catholic and I knew it I knew I had to be in that moment and after I recover myself you know ugly crying I'm wiping away snot or whatever we leave the the church and my friend a good friend of mine now ended up marrying my wife and I a couple years later but Father Matthew Gamber good Jesuit there at Xavier University at the time and he says well what'd you think and I said I think I need to become Catholic and I think my friend behind me was very excited. Do you know what I mean? Like he was like, all right, we got one, you know? <clears throat> and uh, I don't know, man, it was, it was incredible. Father Gamber handed me a catechism that they had, these little, the, remember the white version? Yep. It's like a little brick. And I was just a couple years removed from selling dope and all this stuff. And I'm like, that's a big book, man. You know, like what's going on here? And I took it home and I began to read it. He asked me this, another thing. Father Gamber said to me, he said, John, do you, do you have a Bible? You know, read the Gospels. And I was like, the what? I mean, that's how unchristian, you know, I had no idea. I was a, a nun, if you will. And uh, my friend John, the next day, this is, I think this speaks, you know, my friend who took me to Mass, this speaks to how we're to care for those we're evangelizing. But he picked me up the next morning and went and took me and got my own New Testament. It was like a little pilgrimage, you know, to a Catholic bookstore downtown or whatever. And I began to read that. I just read the Gospels every day, and I'd read the Catechism, you know, just straight through. I mean, it was like star feasting on the scroll in the Old Testament, right? Just eating it all and not pretending I understood all of it, but so much of it answered. I felt like my whole life, I felt like you guys got the directions, the book, and I had no idea. You know, like you got the instructions and I was left out, square peg, round whole world. Well, and we're going to pause here, but you know, I'll, I'll tell you, John, what uh, this powerfully uh, illustrates, it wasn't so much that you got infused knowledge because you had a whole lot to learn yet, right. Amen. but you got an, an infused hunger. An infused Amen. awakening and a, you know the work of grace. Amen. That's why we believe so strongly that we're saved by grace through faith. Faith, Amen. though, is a gift of this grace. Yeah, which you had been given that uh, unaware, and and maybe it was having the clean slate of it all that <laughs> made it so uh, awakening for you at that moment. We'll we'll talk a bit more when we come back from the break. See you then. Welcome back to The Journey Home. I'm your host, Marcus Rodi, and our guest is John Leyendecker. Uh, oh, and before I get on, UWTN gives me this permission to at least remind you of the Coming Home Network website, chnetwork.org. Write that down, chnetwork.org, where you'll find lots of conversion stories like John's. And so I, I want to encourage you to go check that out. John, you know, when I was thinking about over the break, uh, your experience, it tells us, I think, a lot of things, and one of them is that if the Lord is leading us to invite somebody to Mass, there may be 4 other thousand voices trying to say, I don't do that. Amen. But your experience is you never know what God might do. Amen. Yeah. You never know. Yeah. I think uh, it's powerful. You know, the... In the early church, of course, you know, now that I'm, you know, this is what I do now, study and teach, I guess. And uh, 
you know, in the early church, the mass was never a place of evangelization. Mm-hmm. Here in this modern era, you know, in, in so much, um, it doesn't have to be, but it oftentimes will be now. Because this is, how many people do we have in the pews that have never had the encounter of Christ, even though they might have been coming their whole life? How many people, if you would just invite a neighbor who's somewhat familiar or whatever, you know? I always think about, you know, St. Elizabeth Ann Seton, I think it was, she went to Mass and she saw the care with which the priest cleansed the vessels. And that led to her conversion. You, you, know? just, you, never, you never know, know right? You really never know. I, I think of, of one of my best friends, uh, Dr. Kenneth Howell, who's been on the program, and he talks about even giving lectures at, at the seminary he was teaching at about sacraments and all that, but it was when he visited Mass and the priest held up the host Amen. that he knew. Yeah. And that's a gift of grace. Yep. It, it, it's the gift of grace. We can't calculate that. We can't count on it. But on the other hand, we know God loves, and as you were saying, you knew God loved you. And since we know that to be true, we need to give that opportunity for people Amen. Amen. to be there. So there you were, you, uh, and you're given your first catechism. Yeah. And after reading that, you were a saint. <laughs> exactly. Right. <laughs> Never struggled again. It's been perfect since. Please call my wife and verify. You know. But no. So I'm I'm reading my way into the church in a sense. I've had this encounter, but now I'm getting fortified. You know, the nourishment, if you will. And hmm. man, it was crazy. I just. So many things, like I said, just clicked in the place. I'm like, man, how do people not talk about this? How do they not know? And I'm talking to Catholics. I'm a weekend. I'm talking to Catholics like everybody knows. And then I'm learning, right? You know, <laughs> and I remember, though, about two weeks in, I finished the catechism. You know, it's I'm just nonstop reading. And I'm at an Indian food buffet and I finish it and I literally throw it on the ground in the middle of this thing. And I'm so mad. I'm so mad that I need to become Christian. I'm I'm convicted by the truth, by this experience, and I have to become Christian, this thing that I had hated. And I had had some experiences with Christians that didn't bode well for me. And so here I am, I'm I'm all in. I'm, I got nowhere left to go. You know, it's the Peter moment, you know, where else are we going to go, Lord? And I'm so mad. And I remember the lady asking me, she's like, are you okay? You know, with an Indian accent. And I was like, no, I'm not okay. I think I have to become Catholic. And it was incredible. I mean, just an incredible moment. She looked at me confused. She obviously wasn't a South Indian, you know, St. Francis Xavier Catholic. She was probably Hindu or whatever. And she said, well, would you like some more bread? You know, and I was like, yeah, you know, (laughs) Indian food buffet is great, you know, so, but, so I I did that. And, you know, as I entered into the church, you know, I became Catholic Easter in 1999 under the tutelage of, uh, I had these Jesuits, Father Matthew Gamber, and now Father David McConey, who was just a scholastic then, but Father David McConey at St. Louis U now. These guys were so formative in my life, but they direct me to do RCIA with the Dominicans at St. Gertrude Parish in Cincinnati, where their novitiate is and all these mm-hmm. things for the Eastern province. And um, encountered some great Dominicans there, guys that were just on fire with the faith, but also intellectually challenging and sound, and they could really wrestle with any questions I had as well. And uh, look back how grateful I am for that formation mm. and just these guys were they thought about their faith and it was beautiful you know we had incredible conversations and an incredible community that they had raised up around them of lay people so it almost sounds like going back where you didn't even finish seventh grade and and but at the same time God was awakening you to this he was awakening you to intellectual life mm-hmm I mean, all that was happening at the same time. Reminds me of that beatitude, hungering and thirst for righteousness. Amen. Amen. And so, yeah, I, I came into the church and started discerning the priesthood because I thought, man, that's, that's what a Catholic guy does. You know, like I need to at least look at this. And I had some powerful experiences and things like that. And I remember I was really praying about, you know, should I think about the priesthood or whatever? And no joke, in the mail the next day, you know, this is how God works with me as to remind me, but in the mail, a friend of mine, you know, this priest mailed me a book and he said, please join our priesthood discernment group. And it was Thomas Merton's seven story mountain, right? And I was like, well, I guess this is a sign, you know, and I'm out in the world, you know, I'm waiting tables at that point at a, a bookstore cafe. And, but I'm sharing my whole life and my experience as I'm going through and people are coming to church with me because of it. People are catching on. They're like, wow, you're pretty real, but you're doing, you're Catholic, you know? And so I started discerning and I started praying a lot and doing all that. And, you know, old sins die hard. 
You know, like just because you become Catholic, just because you encounter yeah. our Lord doesn't mean that that the passion inside of you, and I use that in the, the negative sense, the Pauline sense, I guess, that that passion dies or whatever in the sense of being attached to things in the world. And I still struggle in some areas, chastity, different stuff like that, and um, and thought, man, I can never be a Catholic priest. You know, I could never could never go without a wife or anything like this. Some of the, mm-hmm. maybe there's some young men out there today that are thinking along those lines. And But I remember what happened was I was dating a girl at the Ohio State University. I was at <laughs> Xavier at the time. And I went up to visit her and uh, we spent the night together, but not doing anything bad. It was a new experience for me in this year yeah. post-conversion, you know, of being in the church with the sacraments. And I just, prayed with her. I counseled her. I talked to her. I spoke about how beautiful she was, not just because of her outside, but because of her soul and these yeah. things she was interested in or whatever. And this was new for me, man. Like I was not, that's not who I was, you know? And I, I remember I went to the game the next day. I was going to the Ohio State UC game. And I went there and my stepdad and my stepgrandmother were at the game. And I showed up and I went over to their section to say hi. And they said, uh, well, how are you? And I said, I think I'm supposed to be a Catholic priest. And they grew up Protestant and they were just kind of like, uh, you want a hot dog? Like, I mean, you know, they just didn't get what I was saying, you know, but I knew that was on a Saturday afternoon. I knew, you know, on Monday morning, I need to call the vocation director and look into this. And then God had other plans. As soon as I was ready to let go, finally, you know, I let go of that. And then Sunday night, 10 PM mass, same church where I had my conversion. I was there meeting my friend who had brought me to my first mass. And there was this particularly attractive redhead greeting people. You know how, you know, at student masses, there's greeters and whatnot. And, and I started talking to her. Hey, you know, how you doing? And I was like, I thought I had never seen her before. And she was like, I know who you are. You know, you became Catholic this year, blah, blah, blah. And she's talking about all this stuff. I'm like, how do you know all this? You know, and she's like, I go to mass with you every day. We had a community of students, maybe 50 students or 40 students went to daily mass at 10 p.m. And I was like, really? And she's like, yeah, I'm so-and-so's roommate. And I was like, okay, why did I never notice you, you know? (laughs) And so we just started talking and she said she was a cradle Catholic and I'm going to impress her. You know, I'm discerning the priesthood, you know, all of 24 hours, you know, (laughs) even though I've been praying about it and and she was like, oh, okay. And, you know, and I thought she was one of these lukewarm cradle Catholics. And I thought, man, I need to help her. I said, you know, like, you should hear, you know, she said, where do you go to high school? That's the popular question in Cincinnati, not where, you know, not where you went to college. And I said, uh, I didn't. I dropped out in seventh grade. She said, oh, that's interesting. Trying to probably blow me off. You know, I come to find out later. And I said, yeah, you should hear the story sometime, you know, and like, that was my in my invitation to stalk her, I think. You know what I mean? So uh, I knew her roommates. So I started calling. And uh, Marcus, to be honest, that was the, the second greatest thing that ever happened to me besides encountering Jesus was uh, coming to know Lisa. And uh, we were married a few years later. And uh, that's when more came up in our life. You know, the challenge to the faith about being open to life and contraception yeah. and all these yeah. different things. And before it was, oh, how could you possibly live without, you know, relations in that way? And now I'm thinking, how the heck can you be married? What am I supposed to have? A hundred kids, man? Like, this is crazy, you know, like, because that's all I knew, you know, and I'm just getting formed in it or whatever. And so we encountered some couples, these Jesuits on these silent retreats they would have for us as students would have couples come in and give testimony about overcoming addictions to pornography and contraception and all these different things. And really how formative that time was that Lisa and I took the great leap and said, you know what, we'll be open to life. And I thought, man, I was an only child. You know, what am I, what am I gonna do with more than one, maybe two, right? And so uh, Marcus, like I said, that I know about right now, I have eight children at home. So pretty crazy, <laughs> ages almost 16 <laughs> down to almost two. So. There's a, let me bounce a scripture off you to talk about the importance of this. Paul, in uh, Philippians, uh, has this great statement in which he says, he says, um, 
okay, not that I have already obtained this and I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own Amen. because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brethren, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Amen. I mean, reflect Amen. on that about your whole journey. Yeah. It's humbling, you know. I mean, who am I, right? Who are you? Who are we? You know, in the in the awesome sight of God, um, He's been such a father to me. I told you about being a prodigal son, right? Yep. You know, and yep. having my own father die, and then having this powerful experience of coming home, coming out of this life of sin, this Augustinian conversion, and um, the thing that really, the second step that kind of moved me was realizing that. I wasn't just called to come home and be a father. You know, I was the lo beloved son, but come home to the father. But I was called to become like the father. Mm -hmm. And so that first began in welcoming others home, you know, calling, calling others home and welcoming them and loving them where they were at and where I was at at that time, you know. And then the, you know, the most uh, overwhelming joy of becoming a father myself, you know. People talk about that father wound, and that's really, it's real, you know. Yeah. But God began working that out in my heart, and he gave me grace to become. I don't know if I'm a good father, but I'm trying, man. I'm trying to be a good dad, you know. I was going to wonder about that, about, about learning to be a father. Yeah. Because I remember you said earlier that there was a time when you were told you're the man of the house. Well, yeah. what does that mean? Well, it means yeah. getting drunk or all that stuff. Yeah. Well, now you got now you got to be a father. Amen. Yeah, and so... It's been really special, you know, my, it was God's ordained, you know, this moment, but uh, our firstborn, we didn't find out it was a surprise, and it was a boy. It was my son, Maximilian, you know. Hey. I love all my kids, but that first kid, that first moment, it's particularly special, you know. Um, I remember the doctor being like, you can't cry on the baby like that. It's not, you know, sanitary. I'm like trying to cut the umbilical cord, you know. <laughs> And I just remember looking, you know, for the second time in my life, I remember looking at Lisa and saying, I would die for her. And I looked at him and I said, I would do anything for you. And I look at my own children that way now. And it's been really special. You know, my son just went to high school. He's a big football player and they just won a state championship, the LaSalle Lancers. And uh, it's been really special to be a part of that with him, um, that bonding and stuff. I played some football, you know, and these long car rides in the, you know, on the way to school and back and talking little windshield time. And um, I, I, in some ways, you know, I have little kids and older kids and it's different spots, but I'm, I'm really blessed to be a dad, to just be a father, you know, and I get to love my kids in their poor decisions, their good decisions, their gifting, their not gifting, you know, all these things. And, uh, it's doing nothing, Marcus, but discipling me, you know? It's teaching me. I think one of the, I mean, there's so many important scriptures, of course, obviously. But some always have jumped out at me, and one that I want you to reflect on a little bit, given your whole long journey, is uh, so key, key is Ephesians 5, 25. Husband, love your wives as Christ Jesus loves the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. Amen. Love our wives as Christ loved the church. Yeah. I try. I, I did some dishes last night, Marcus. You know, I'm really trying, you know. <laughs> it's, the, it's, the, it's the little things, you know, that mean the most to my wife. You know, my wife, uh, we homeschool the younger ones. My two oldest go to high school, but... The younger ones and for her to do that and to take care of our home and to put up with me right I mean I really do try to lavish on her through words you know I try to speak blessing to my wife you know and tell her what she means often and uh, tell her the good things that she needs to hear you know because I mean I think sometimes man especially the Catholic moms that are, you know, really out there trying to love Jesus and love their kids and do it all, right? They're all, they're superheroes mm -hmm. and they live in a thankless world most of the time, underappreciated sometimes by their own spouses. And if anything, I can mess up by not doing enough around the house or, 
you know, all my faults and failings or whatever, but at least at the end of the day, my kids saw that I loved my wife deeply and I was able to say that out loud and show it sometimes in my actions, you know, <laughs> stumble forward, so. Um, you came <clears throat> into this journey a little bit different. Uh, so maybe theological questions were not the big ones for you. Right. Because you didn't come w with the baggage right. on your shoulder. But what, what maybe was the hardest part about the church when you came in for you, the hardest hurdle to come in, or maybe that hurdle came after you came in. What would you say yeah. the hardest hurdle to deal with? You know, I, for me, I mean, I think contraception was a, you know, I, I struggled with that quite a bit, you know. Yeah. Um, that was a, like I said, when we were getting married and we were, those retreats leading up, I mean, I saw that it was possible, you know, and, um, but I saw the beauty of these families, you know, I mean, yeah. I would, and the arguments helped, right? You need, I needed that intellectual part. I'm a, I'm a reasonable guy in that regard, you know, but I think the lived experience of seeing these different families, these families that were so beautiful that did have four, five, six, eight, ten kids, you know, and I was like, man, that looks like complete madness, but it is beautiful. And so I think... I think that was a big part. I think the papacy and what that meant and different things like that. Um, when did you come into the church? Easter 99. Easter 99. Yeah. So you came in just, well, you're, you're, you're coming in just before Y2K and yeah. all the stuff that was going on at that time of period. And then, of course, the scandal, which came out in 2002. Yeah. So you had a lot of stuff right <laughs> on the tail of, of your coming in. Amen. And, uh, yeah, it was, it was a tumultuous time, you know, and I've... Since I've come into the church, basically, I've been involved in ministry, if you will, you know, yeah, evangelization and discipleship. You, you, you landed running. Yeah, right. I came in and people heard my testimony. They wanted me to give talks at youth groups and all that. And I thought, man, I got a heart. I want to tell people about Jesus. Uh, right out of college, became a youth minister for, man, I guess it was four years total. One at one church, three at another. And then focus came knocking. And my Fellowship of Catholic University students. Right. And... Uh, Man, they came and it was an opportunity. And I thought, man, we had just got a house and remodeled a little bit. I was got a big raise in my youth ministry position. The, the ministry's booming. And all of a sudden they were like, hey, you should move to Colorado and serve at this campus. Raise your own salary where you'll know no one. Oh, by the way, by the time you move there, your wife's going to be just a few weeks from giving birth. <laughs> and I thought, Man, that is not a temptation from Satan. That's got to be from Jesus, right? Like Satan wouldn't even try you on that. You know, like that's got to be from the Lord. And so we did it. We, I remember parking. We didn't even have a house when we moved out there. We parked our U-Haul. We just packed up our house, sold our house, parked it in the church we were serving. And I asked the priest, the pastor, I said, hey, I'm your focus missionary, your team director. Can I park my U-Haul out there while we're looking for a house? He was the coolest guy in the world. Said, "Yeah, sure, go ahead." You know, and within a couple of days, had a had a place, a house to rent, and things like that. But I was in focus for seven years. Um, an extraordinary opportunity with Curtis and yeah. everybody out there. And then, similar to that, I had this opportunity at the end. I was discerning what I was going to do in focus, and I got this call from a guy out in Kansas City, Doctor Mike Shurslick. And He said, "I'd like you to come look at School of Faith," <laughs> and. Uh, said, School of Faith? I never heard of School of Faith. What is this? And he said, well, come out and talk to me. I'm in Kansas City. I said, that's really strange. I'm going to be at Benedictine giving a talk in the next two weeks. Would that work? And he said, yeah, that'd be great. And I came out there to hear about this apostolate and what they were doing. And I knew I was supposed to go. You know, one of those things, you just know, you know, you know. So. Well, but, but again, it, it's being open to the, to the fact that God does communicate w with us. He mm -hmm. does inspire. He does, again, as St. Francis de Sales talks about, you know, it, it, when he's speaking, the question is, do we listen and do we Amen. respond? You know, or, or we just blow it off? Or so, uh, but you've been open to that. Amen. And we hope we encourage more people to be listening. God, speak to me and help me know how to follow your will. We have an email here. Louise from Ohio. She doesn't say whether she's from one of those churches used to be or not. But we'll just one down. Louise from Ohio, some dear friends of mine are not religious and don't believe in God, though they aren't militantly atheist. The wife recently told me 
that the whole God issue just doesn't make much of a difference to them, and they are happy where they are. How can I best share with them why believing in God and following him is so important? I've always been a Christian, so don't understand their perspective. Amen. Uh, I think what I would say to her first and foremost, and we say this often generically, but I want to talk about in the sense of, you know, the soul of the apostolate, right? When we're talking about evangelization and ministry in the church, that I would begin to diligently and daily pray for those that I want to encounter Jesus, Hmm. to really pray. And Our Lady of Fatima says to offer some sacrifice, right? Hmm. All these people are, she says, literally are going to hell because no one will pray for them. That's our first thing. It's not, it's not the apologetics first. It's not the arguments. It's not all that. Will you commit to praying for them? And so that'd be my first thing. Will you, will you really pray? Will you offer something? You know, it can be small, like St. Jose Maria Escriva says, like no ketchup on your French fries or something. I mean, it could be little or it could be a whole meal or a whole day, whatever it is, but offer something for their benefit. And then two, take an interest in their life. Spend time with them. You know, School of Faith, now we talk a lot about being in good conversation with people. People generally come to God through someone else, right? I mean, you hear the generic, we're the hands and feet of Jesus now and all that, but really we are. We're the ones that are carrying that message. We're the messengers now. And so to have that opportunity to walk with somebody, to befriend them, focus called it incarnational evangelization, being with people, spending time with them, building friendship, asking them, you know, good conversations are a lot like a good meditation. I'm asking you questions, you're reflecting, giving me answers, talking, sharing back and forth. And you can't help but in those moments for the things of the human heart, the human spirit, the desire for God to come out, whether that's through beauty, truth, or goodness, whatever it is, you know. Well, and I think your story uh, speaks to the fact that you just have to trust that if you invite someone to mass or you you you, you leave it in god's hands right. because that's what he did in your life yeah. your friend that invited you to mass had no idea right. that his invitation was connecting with a voice you had heard yeah. he had no idea None at all but he was yet willing to be a channel of that amen and, and invite you to mass yeah i uh i came across uh i came across something the other day i'm not not sure who said it i thought for the longest time that curtis had actually said it but it it was eternity is worth the awkwardness, right? <laughs> We're so shy to talk about faith today and these different things. But what happened was, is he was willing to be awkward. He's willing for me to say no to going to mass or whatever. Yeah. Little did he know what was going on. And if you receive those promptings, you don't know what God's asking you to do and what he's got going on behind the scenes, right? And so I would say for people like that, eternity is worth the awkwardness. Give an invitation. Let's try and get one more email in, my friend. Jordan from New Mexico writes, As a cradle Catholic, I know I often take my faith for granted. This year, I really want to go deeper in my faith life and make it a priority. What are some practical and simple steps I can take to take my faith to the next level? Yeah, well, first, Marcus, shameless plug, dailyrosary.net. Every right? Bob's going to make sure you got yeah, that in. Dailyrosary.net. Um, my bo- boss, Dr. Mike Scherzlick, does this incredible rosary meditation every day. And so if we want to get closer to God, you want to get closer to anyone, you got to spend time with them. Yeah. And so this is an opportunity, a great meditation every day, 10, 20, 30 minutes, you know, like whatever you can listen to of it. But it's praying the rosary in a meditative way and different theological reflections. Spend time talking to God. That's how you're going to grow. Our Lord, uh, in the Sermon on the Mount, gives these three ways. Prayer, fasting, alms. He's giving. Amen. So in the big sense, but there's also a little sense. Yeah. You know, prayer, uh, what can you give up? Yep. And how can you give? Yep. A little bit. Think of ways to do that. Amen. And so, and you know, you know about today, you know how people, we're all glued to our phones or devices, different things. <laughs> you know, when you take time to pray today, you're taking time away from the radio or the TV or your phone or whatever. So in a way you got your fast built in, you know what I mean? Like yeah. giving that time, given that, that opportunity for God to do something. I had a spiritual director said, always just put yourself in the path of probability, right? You want to get hit by a car, go in the middle of the highway. You want to get hit by God? Spend time in prayer or in a church. All right. Thank you, John. 
Thank you very, very this much. This was awesome. Thank you for joining us on the program. And uh, again, I remind the uh, audience of your website, dailyrosary.net. Yeah. Right, that's one. There's also schooloffaith.com if that's you want correct. to find out more about yeah. that. All right, thank you, John. And thank you for joining us on this episode of The Journey Home. I do pray that John's journey is encouragement to you. God bless.